Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we have here Mr. Nicholas Orland, who's going to introduce the topic about applied behavior analysis, how an eBay approach can provide good outcomes in inclusive environments. And I'm going to give the lead to Mr. Nicholas himself to introduce himself further. Thank you. OK, well, thank you everybody for coming. Um, I'm really excited about today's topic. It's going to be about applied behavioral analysis and how an ABA approach can provide good outcomes in an inclusive environment. I'm a huge fan of applied behavioral analysis, as you will tell over the next hour, uh, but I do think that the approach of behavioral analysis can be an incredibly effective one. So I'll tell you a little bit about who I am. Um, so my name is Nicholas Orland. I'm a board certified behavior analyst uh, through the National Certification Board of Behavioral Analysis. I'm also a licensed behavior analyst. I'm originally from the United States, um, so I'm licensed in a couple states there. I've been in the field for about 18 years, working with individuals with developmental and intellectual disabilities. I'm an adjunct professor at two universities, the Florida Institute of Technology and Endicott College. I'm also a PhD student at Endicott College, where I'm uh, finishing up my doctorate and doing research on cultural humility and sensitivity. And I'm the autism program head at Dubai Autism Center. So let's get into this workshop and we're going to be talking about applied behavioral analysis. So let me give you a general overview of what behavioral analysis, applied behavioral analysis is. So applied behavioral analysis is the science of systematically applying interventions based upon, interve uh, based upon basic principles of behavior to improve socially significant behavior to a meaningful degree. So let's break this down with a practical example. Let's say we have a child who engages in a problem behavior because they want access to mom's attention. So what we would ultimately do here is look at the behavior, identify why it's occurring, and then make some changes to the environment so that it doesn't happen again in the future. So the behavior analytic approach, what we're ultimately doing is, again, I analyzing the behavior and coming up with approaches so that we can change that behavior in the future to a meaningful degree. Now, our interventions are based on the function of behavior. When I say function of behavior, I mean why the behavior is occurring. And our approach is much different from other social sciences because of that very phenomenon. When we're working with children or we're working in classroom environments, which we'll be talking about in a little bit, we're not necessarily going to be focusing on the individual themselves. We're going to be focusing on the environment. So by focusing on the environment, we're able to produce those, those outcomes that we, that we want. So that's what makes applied behavioral analysis different from other social sciences, like a psychology, for example, where we tend to focus on the individual. Now, let me give you a simple example of applied behavioral analysis, because I know that that was a mouthful, and I always think a practical example usually helps solidify those concepts. So if you're a parent, you can certainly relate to this example, I would assume. Let's say you have a child, let's say her, her name's Anna. And every time Anna's told, okay, it's time to go to sleep, Anna, Anna flops on the stairs. She does not want to go upstairs. So if we were to look at this through uh, a general perspective, we might say what? Well, Anna's being lazy, Anna doesn't want to go upstairs. We'll come up with a lot of uh, mentalistic explanations as to why Anna doesn't want to go upstairs. Now, the problem with that perspective and that worldview is that we can't fix anything. Right now, we got a little girl that's flopping on the stairs. She's crying, she doesn't want to go upstairs. I want to fix that. So typically what we would do is, like I said, label that child as being lazy or not wanting to go upstairs. Now, if we're going to use an applied behavior analytic approach, it's going to look a little different. So the first thing we're going to want to do is identify what the behavior is, what exactly is going on here. So we're not gonna simply say, Anna's upset or she's out of sorts, because that doesn't really help us with anything. And I don't really know what being upset or out of sorts is. Rather, I wanna focus first on the behavior. What did Anna actually do? Well, in this case, Anna flopped on the stairs and cried. Okay, so step one of an ABA approach is identifying what the behavior is. In this case, Anna flopped on the stairs and she cried. Now, once we've identified the behavior in a very objective manner, very specifically, she flopped on the floor and cried, we wanna now take a look at the environment 
and identify why did she do it? So we want to identify the why of the behavior. And that is called the function of behavior. Why is this particular behavior occurring? Now, before we get back to this example, let me just focus on, on this element because I think this is an important one. When we look at reasons why behaviors occur, there's usually four main reasons why. They're called the four functions of behavior. So let's review those real quick. Tangible. Tangible is when somebody engages in a behavior to get access to something in their immediate environment. So for example, if I'm a child and I want an iPad, I might appropriately say, mom, can I have the iPad? Or I might grab the iPad. Both would be falling under the tangible function. Attention. I'm a child and I want my mom's attention. I might say, hey, mom, or I might cry, or I might engage in another problem behavior. That would be means to get access to attention. Sensory, we call those automatically reinforced behaviors. So that would maybe be stemming behavior, uh, listening to music, watching the iPad, that would all fall under the sensory function of behavior. And escape, I don't wanna do something, so I do something to not have to do that. So if I ask someone asks me to do chores, I'm a child, I might run away, I might flop on the floor, I engage in the behavior to get that particular thing removed. That would be an escape function. So when we look at behavior, it tends to fall into one of these four categories, one of these four functions. Now, what's interesting about this, and I'm sure you guys could probably relate to this, is as adults, we engage in behaviors for the same reasons. Tangible, for anybody that knows me, I love Diet Coke, Diet Pepsi, I drink it all the time. So I engage in a lot of behavior to get access to Diet Pepsi. Attention, if I want somebody's attention, I'll simply call their name and I'll get their attention. Sensory maintained behavior, I like to listen to music, I like to read books, I like to watch movies. Those would all be automatically reinforced behaviors, behaviors that are reinforced within myself. And escape. I escape things all the time. I was just in, in the Dubai mall. Uh, they're, they're opening things up, which is wonderful, but that also means that annoying person with the perfumes coming around. So when I walk down the mall, I see that annoying person with the perfume. What do I do? I walk on the other side of the mall to escape that individual. I'm engaging in a behavior to escape something. Now, the reason I wanted to make those points is that we engage in behavior for the same reason that children do. So the reason isn't the problem that's at fault here. It's the way the child goes about the behavior that tends to be the challenge. So our goal from an applied behavior analytic approach is to change the behavior, not necessarily change the reason why the behavior is occurring. So let's get back to the end example. Again, we got a little girl flopping on the floor because she doesn't want to go upstairs. Okay, so every time we ask Anna to go upstairs, she flops, engages in problem behavior. So we can assume at this point that Anna's trying to escape going upstairs. She doesn't want to go upstairs. So we've identified the function. She's doing this to escape. Now, once we know that, we can do a lot of particular things. We know what the behavior is. She's flopping on the floor. We know the why. She's doing it because she wants to escape. She doesn't want to go upstairs. So once we know that, we take an approach where we focus on two specific areas. Proactive supports, what we can do to prevent this from happening in the future, and the reactive support. Once this behavior happens, what do we do? So let's take a look at this in Anna's case. What could we do in Anna's case? So we, again, we got a little girl flopped on the floor, or flopped on the stairs rather. She doesn't want to go upstairs. How can we prevent that from happening? Well, one thing we could do is make going upstairs fun. Let's say she's got all the fun things downstairs and now we say, okay, go upstairs where there's nothing fun. Well, she's gonna engage in escape maintain behavior. We, we would know that. Make going upstairs fun. Put some fun things upstairs so the transition goes smoothly. We could also teach Anna to ask for more time. Instead of flopping on the floor, we could simply ask her to say, can I have more time downstairs? Teach a skill. We could also focus on teaching Anna to accept no. When Anna asks for more time, we say, no, 
Anna, you got to go upstairs, or we can teach Anna to wait. So from a proactive pr uh, perspective, we can focus on teaching these particular skills. On a reactive skill, we simply don't remove the request. If Anna flops on the stairs, we don't let that behavior yield in escape. We, we keep the demand on, you need to go upstairs. Anna will then go upstairs. Now, by doing this approach, some incredible things happen. First of all, the problem behavior is going to decrease. Why? Because it's not going to work anymore. Because right now she flops on the floor, or flops on the stairs rather, she, that's not going to res result in her not going upstairs. She's going to have to go upstairs. So it's not going to work. Also, the appropriate behavior is going to increase. If I'm teaching Anna to ask for more time, she's going to engage in that appropriate behavior, which is a good thing. Also, we're focusing on teaching new skills. We're going to focus on teaching Anna the importance of accepting no. We're going to teach Anna the importance of waiting. We're going to teach the Anna the importance of asking. So we've identified one problem here, a little child flopping on the stairs, and we used it as an opportunity to improve her quality of life. I've taught her three really important things here, how to ask for things, how to accept no, and how to wait for things. This one problem behavior served as a platform for improvement of life. And that's what we do in a behavior analytic approach. When we look at a problem behavior, we don't just tell her, oh, she's being lazy or she doesn't want to go upstairs. If we did that, we wouldn't have these amazing opportunities to teach new things. Under this approach, we were able to do that. And by virtue of that, potentially improve her quality of life. And that's the basics of applied behavioral analysis. Our worldview focuses on the environment over the individual. If a child's not doing something, we don't blame them. And how often does that happen? If a child's not doing something, our instinct as educators, as parents, is to assign blame to the child. But should we be doing that? Is it the child or is it the environment that we've created? Are there things that we could be teaching to produce those problem behaviors or get rid of those problem behaviors? I would suggest there are. So we want to ultimately focus on those particular variables because by changing the environment, we can produce a better behavioral outcome. So I'm the autism program head at Dubai Autism Center. I have a staff about 75 that, that I supervise. When my staff don't perform, I don't blame them. I'm not going to say it's your fault for not doing this, this, and this. The first thing I do is I look at the systems I have in place. Is my system effective? And nine times out of 10, it's not my staff's fault. It's my fault because I didn't create an effective environmental condition for them to be successful. I wasn't clear with my expectation. I didn't train them effectively. So by embracing this worldview, we go about trying to fix things, by trying to produce better outcomes and not putting the blame on the individual. So tying this back to children, if a child's engaging in problem behavior in a classroom environment, or let's say a child has special needs and they're engaging in problem behavior, we don't want to assign blame to them. What we want to do is we want to look at the environment and see what we can do better. How can we arrange this environment better for this child to have a, a better outcome, less problem behavior? And by doing that, we tend to see some really good results. Now, with behavioral analysis, the one thing we've got to keep in mind, because a lot, when a lot of people hear ABA or behavioral management, they tend to think it's just for problem behavior. But that's not what we do. We ultimately focus on skill acquisition, on teaching new skills to replace those problem behaviors that we may see. So just to break down the words of applied behavioral analysis, because I find that this helps people really understand ABA. Applied, socially significant improving somebody's quality of life. Behavior, anything a living organism does. Analysis, finding functional relations between the two. Meaning, is what I'm doing having an effect on behavior? So for example, if I'm trying to teach a child something, is my teaching procedure working? If it's not, I need to make a change to my teaching procedure. So by focusing on these three primary concepts, socially significant, improving someone's quality of life, identifying the behavior, what is it the child's doing or not doing, and trying to identify if what we're doing is working or not working, we have some amazing outcomes. 
Now, there are some misconceptions about applied behavioral analysis. For those who may not know, applied behavioral analysis is really, really new. The certification board was established in 1998 to give you some perspective on that, uh, whereas I believe the medicine board was uh, established in the late 1800s. So um, we're still relatively new and there's a lot of misconceptions about applied behavioral analysis. So just to clear some of those up, ABA is only utilized for problem behavior. And that's simply not true. Uh, applied behavioral analysis is focused on teaching skills. And I'm going to illustrate some other examples of that a, a little later on. But applied behavioral analysis is focused on teaching skills rather than managing challenging behavior. Applied behavioral analysis tries to make people normal. I've heard about that ABA stuff, but it's just trying to make individuals normal. No, our, our goal isn't to make individuals normal. Our goal is to teach critical skills, in teaching those particular skills that we ultimately need. And the last one, applied behavioral analysis is only used with children on the autism spectrum. Again, that's not true. Applied behavioral analysis can be utilized in all fields. I'm going to be talking about ABA and how it can be utilized in school environments, um, but it can be utilized in every field. Um, as you just heard, I, I use it as a management strategy in human resources at Dubai Autism Center. We also utilize it as a clinical application as well. So there's a wide range for what we can use applied behavioral analysis principles for. So getting back to applied behavioral analysis and its clinical application, ABA can be utilized as a treatment for children with developmental delays, including autism. And the reason we utilize this treatment is because we use it to teach skills. So for example, let's say I've got a little guy on the autism spectrum who can't yet communicate. Well, I'm not gonna accept that. I, I need to teach this little guy how to communicate. So an ABA approach focuses on doing that teaching those skills to the child who doesn't yet have them. Let's take a look at social skills, making a friend. Could you imagine going through life not being able to make friends with people, not having friends? We can't accept that with children with special needs. What do we do? Teach those skills. We do it through an applied behavior analytic approach. Why do we use ABA? Because it works. There's thousands of research studies showing its effectiveness, and that's why it's one of the evidence-based treatments that we utilize with children on the autism spectrum. So again, our terminal goal with working with children with special needs, developmental delays, speech delays, teach the skills to children who don't yet have them so they can have a better quality of life. Now, it can also be utilized, applied behavioral analysis, in the classroom environment. We can utilize these principles to modify school environments, to make them more inclusive, to focus on managing challenging behavior in classroom environments. So the Behavior Analyst Certification Board, the BACB, was founded in 1998, as I mentioned, and it found that over 30% of all jobs, all behavior analysts work in school environments. Well, why is that? Well, because we want to make educational productive. We want to rearrange the environment so your child can benefit from an education. Behavioral analysis can do that. Behavioral analysis offers that opportunity to analyze the environment, rearrange the environment to produce those better outcomes. And again, there's a lot of research showing its effectiveness. So the use of certified um, professionals in educational environments serve many uses. Skill acquisition, behavior reduction being the primary ones. And there are many practical uses for ABA in the school environment, which I will talk about right now. So the big one, the big area where applied behavioral analysis can be utilized is inclusion. I'm sure everyone's heard this word inclusion before, and inclusion really captures an all embracing societal ideology. But really, when we look at it from the perspective of education, it's, it's a little more specific. We want to focus on individuals with disabilities and special education programs that secure them the opportunities to engage with other students that do not have those specific disabilities. So it's basically creating an environment where children with special needs, with developmental delays, can again engage with individuals who don't necessarily have those developmental delays in a classroom environment. Now, inclusion is what we have to strive for. That's the terminal goal. Our goal is to ultimately work in an inclusive environment, have children with special needs, with developmental delays, with special educational uh, challenges 
in neurotypical school environments because there's many benefits from that model. So let's talk about the student who has the disability. How does that student benefit from being in an inclusive classroom? Well, the type of inclusion is going to vary from individual to individual. And there's no one set inclusion. It's going to vary based on a bunch of conditions. But the general benefits include assisting with the child being on a neurotypical trajectory. What I mean by that is when we look at social skill development, for example, I want a child to do the same thing that other nine year olds are going to do. Nine year olds are playing Pokemon or playing with GI Joes. I want all children doing that. So by embedding a child in an inclusive environment, we, we, we run the risk of that happening, which is a good thing. We create a lot of natural learning opportunities. Play skills are arguably one of the most important skills that your child will ever learn. I know that's kind of an odd thing because when we think of skill sets and, and skills being developed, we think of academics, right? We think of reading, we think of writing, and all those things are very important. I'm not suggesting they're not. But the play skill, I would suggest, is one of the most important. And let's think about why. Because it provides a platform for engagement at a very young level. How does a child accept no? Okay, and let's take a step back. Let's look at our own behavior. We are all, as adults, experts at accepting no. Why is that? Well, we've been told no a lot, right? Can I get a raise? No. Can I have a day off? No. We, we get told no a lot. So we're experts at that. Where did we learn that skill? Most likely when we were four or five years old and we're on the playground and we wanted a car and, and our friends said, no, you can't have the car. So we want to create these natural opportunities so children with developmental delays benefit from them so that they can learn these skills that are going to be very, very critical. The school environment really provides a lot of naturalistic opportunities to do that. Therefore, school environments um, like all the schools out there, including our school, Dubai Autism Center, really provide a lot of those opportunities where these skills can ultimately be, uh, be implemented, be utilized. Now, this is the most important element of inclusion, and sadly, it's one of the ones that we tend to forget. The student with the disability benefits, but guess who also benefits? The student who doesn't have the disability. Now, when I was working in the United States, I had a lot of families um, that would come to meetings and would not want inclusion in their school environment. And the reasons they didn't want inclusion was because they felt that inclusion would take away from their children. My child doesn't have a disability, but that teacher is not going to be attending to my child because they're going to have to attend to the child with special needs. That, that's what the, the parent's perspective was. It was a very, very controversial issue. But I would suggest that this actually enhances a child's educational environment. This is going to benefit the child who doesn't have, the, have that specific variable. Let's look at why. Empathy. Does a child ultimately learn empathy from reading a book? Or does that child learn empathy from learning that other people are different? I would suggest it's from learning that other people are different. And you can do that in an inclusive environment. By simply having individuals that are different, you're setting the tone that that is okay. Anti-bullying, diversity, all of those things can be naturally worked on in an inclusive environment. There are so many amazing opportunities there. Children going to school in an inclusive environment are going to learn these skills, are going to develop these things, and going to ultimately be better and more productive individuals in society by virtue of that. They're going to be the individuals that are going to fight for individuals with special needs because they've seen that being different is okay. Now, when we talk about inclusion, a Dubai is doing it all right. I love the initiatives that Dubai has taken. A lot of parents will come to me and they'll say, you know, I'm, I, I think that I'm going to go to the United States. What's, I, I've worked all over the United States. So the parents will come up to me and say, what, what state is the best for children with, with special needs or inclusion? And I always tell them, Dubai, stay here, stay in Dubai, because Dubai has amazing inclusion efforts. Dubai is a very, has, has a very progressive educational agenda. And one of those agenda items is inclusion. How can we include children with special needs, with developmental delays 
into our classroom environments and they do an amazing job. I'm so proud to work in Dubai because Dubai does this much better than than I think any other country at this point. But their initiatives are really, really great and we're continuing to see that develop more and more in the classrooms around Dubai. Now, we've identified that inclusion is important. It can be successful. It's successful for the individual special needs. It's successful for the individual that doesn't have special needs. Everybody benefits from inclusion. But the question really becomes, how do we do this? How do we make inclusion successful? And most importantly, how can we support our teachers and our teaching assistants to make this inclusive measure successful? And I would suggest that behavioral analysis can offer a lot of opportunities for how we can do that. Now, the answer isn't black and white. I'm not going to suggest that ABA will fix all of the problems that an inclusive model might necessarily have, but the approach itself can be very effective within that transition. So let's keep some things in mind with an inclusive environment, what we have to do to be successful and how ABA can help. The first one is that every child learns differently. Right? There's nothing cookie cutter about children with special needs. There's not one way to teach things. At Dubai Autism Center, we have 87 children. We also have 87 different teaching procedures. Not everything's going to be a little different based on the teaching methodology. So therefore, the teaching methodology needs to be tailored to the student, needs to be specific. And applied behavioral analysis offers that opportunity. By the teaching methodology involved with behavioral analysis, we're able to tailor the teaching procedure to the child. Now, when we do this, this can obviously pose challenges in bigger classrooms where one teaching methodology is typically utilized. And that's where we have the role of the shadow teacher. I'm sure everyone's familiar with the shadow teacher. Basically, it's the teaching assistant that ultimately helps the individual with special needs be successful in the environment. But you have to be very careful with the use of the shadow teacher because the shadow teacher might do everything for the child if they're not properly trained. You know, the, the goal of a child going to a classroom environment isn't to get through 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. The goal is for them to learn, to benefit from those natural learning opportunities that are presented in the classroom environment. So training the shadow teacher on behavioral analysis can be incredibly beneficial, can produce those good outcomes that we want so that the child is successful in that school environment. There's a lot of uh, trainings um, I'm seeing right now that KHDA is ultimately approving. Um, and also you can do what's called RBT training that could also provide that perspective as well. But all of those trainings can be beneficial for the shadow teacher to be successful. So again, if the shadow teacher does everything for your child, they'll get through the day. The teacher will say, hey, little Johnny did really good, but no learning occurred. No natural learning opportunities were taking place. And that's gonna be the tragedy. That's gonna be the sad thing, that opportunity that we missed out on. So we have to make sure that that teaching assistant can capitalize on those learning opportunities through an individualized way, through an individualized support. How do we do that? by training the teacher on the principles of applied behavioral analysis. A shadow teacher with an ABA background will tend to have better clinical judgment, will be more beneficial in the classroom environment, and will be able to assist with those inclusion efforts that we wanna make successful. Now, because every child learns differently, an ABA approach may be utilized for learning. So we can actually utilize an ABA curriculum that could be catered to that specific measure. So in your classroom, you may be, as a teacher, you may be able to use an ABA-based curriculum. So there, there's one curriculum, this is a curriculum that we utilize at the Dubai Autism Center, it's utilized all around the world, called PEAK, which is Promoting Emergence of Advanced Knowledge. It's an excellent option to consider in a classroom where inclusion efforts are, are being implemented. So BEAK is utilized a lot in the United States and it cross-references a lot of common core standards. So for example, let's say you're working on a math lesson in your class and the programming needs to be uh, tailored to, to some specific students. The PEAK program will be, can be utilized so that you're achieving your same goals with a different teaching methodology. 
There are some other programs as well, such as uh, VBMAP, which is also effective, but PEAK, as far as academics go, I find produces the uh, really good outcomes of that. It's really focused on academics, communication skills, and there's a lot of wonderful research showing how effective it is. So to make inclusion work in classroom environments, utilizing ABA curriculums like PEAK may be the way to go because you're able to accomplish what you need to do in your classroom environment, but you're also doing it through an individualized ABA curriculum, which means we're meeting the requirements, but also creating the assistive technology that we need in order for this to be successful. Now, another variable that might make inclusion challenging, which is a child having a problem behavior. It's very common for a child with special needs uh, to engage in challenging behavior. So for example, I, I, I've worked with children where a child will be placed in a classroom and the kid will start running around the classroom. All right. Now the teacher has 15 other students that they have to attend to and there's this one child that's running around the classroom. And the child and the teacher has a challenge now in that I'm trying to teach 15 other students and I have one child that's running around the classroom. And the instinct for the teacher might simply be, this child is not appropriate for my classroom. But what we have to do is provide supports for that teacher. How can we do that? Through an ABA approach. So what we'd ultimately do here is go into the classroom environment and rearrange the environment, but not rearrange what the teacher's doing. So the teacher has certain agenda items that they have to do in a given day. We're not gonna be interfering with that. But what we can do as behavior analysts is make some small changes. An ABA approach can be utilized to make those small changes, to produce those changes in behavior. Because the goal is gonna be prevent the problem behavior. I want this child in this classroom, but I don't want him running around all the time. An applied behavior analytic approach will assist with that. We will create some strategies for the teacher to implement so that that classroom can be more effective, so that that child can be more effective, and that teacher can take control of their classroom and meet their objectives because that has to be the goal of inclusion. Inclusion is not this uh, inconvenience to teachers. It has to be convenient for everybody. We have to make the environment work and we can do that through the principles of applied behavioral analysis. Like I said, by utilizing an ABA approach, we can produce those outcomes. So let's look at this example. This is just a general example. So let's say we have a child who engages in tantrums while doing schoolwork, okay? So let's say this child is sitting at a table and uh, her peers and her are expected to do 40 minutes of work. And about at minute 25, without fail, the child flops on the floor and engages in problem behavior. Now, from the teacher's perspective, they're gonna look at this as, I have a child tantruming I don't think they can stay in my classroom. I don't think this inclusion effort is going to work. But from a behavior analytic perspective, we're going to look at it through a different lens. We're going to look at what's going on in this environment. So in this case, we have some good news. The child is effective for 25 minutes. The child can engage in these behaviors, homework behaviors for 25 minutes, but around 25 minutes, the child engages in problem behavior. So what do we do? We break up the work. The child still has to do 45 minutes of work. I'm not changing that. What I'm simply now going to do is I'm going to break the session up. The child will do two 20 minute sessions, all right? Or maybe a 20 and a 25 minute session to get up to that 45 minute mark. And I'm going to embed a break, a small break in between. So the child's still doing everything being asked of them. We've just made a simple rearrangement to the environment. And by doing this simple rearrangement, we now potentially can get rid of that tantrum behavior and that child can be successful in that classroom environment. Kid still makes the, the 40 minutes, 45 minutes of tabletop work, but the problem behavior is avoided. And this is a very simplistic example of this, but that's what we do with behavioral analysis. We will go into these environments, identify these in variables, make some changes to produce better outcomes. And by doing that, the classroom environment will work much better and we can focus on are these specific inclusive measures. And that's gonna be our ultimate goal with this. Our ultimate goal is to focus on making these classroom environments work, to focus on teaching these particular skills. 
So in making suggestions to managing these behaviors, we also have to take into account the role of the teacher, the assistants, and the culture of the classroom. When we go into a classroom to assist with making it an inclusive environment, we're not trying to change things. We're not trying to change what the teacher is doing, how the teacher is teaching. We're not necessarily going to make those recommendations. What we want to do is rearrange the environment so that the teacher can still hold on to the culture of the classroom, the teachers can do what they have to do, and the teaching assistants have to do what they have to do. Our recommendations are always specific to the teachers and the teaching assistants so that they can be manageable. They're also specific to parents as well. With these behavioral strategies, parents, I'm sure you can understand, you can utilize these at home as well. But they also have to be practical. If you a parent, if you're a parent and you have three other children, you're not necessarily going to be able to do something on a one to one basis. I have to program for that specifically. So when we look at these strategies, we always have to take those things into account. But we can we can look at the environment, come up with some strategies to make that classroom environment or even that home environment more inclusive so the child can ultimately benefit. So what can we do from an applied behavior analytic perspective? Well, we can utilize behavioral analysis to solve challenges in the classroom environment. Okay, what problems can we solve or challenges can we solve? Acquisition. So if I'm trying to teach a child specific skills, I can utilize an ABA curriculum. I can individualize that curriculum to the child so that the child can focus on everything that the teacher would like them to do. I can train the, the teaching assistant on how to make those changes and how to facilitate learning and understanding. At the same time, I can also focus on problem behavior, managing the challenging behavior that the child ultimately may be encountering, focusing on changing the environment so the child can have better outcomes. By doing that, again, we're making a classroom environment conducive to learning, not conducive to behavioral management. If I have a child in a classroom environment, I don't want the teacher managing problem behavior. I want the child to be following the routine of things. And again, we can do that through an ABA approach. Dissemination of applied behavioral analysis to school professionals. A lot of people don't know what applied behavioral analysis is. It's still relatively new science. Some of you on this call right now may have never heard of applied behavioral analysis before. A lot of people haven't. But it's really important for us to educate people on what behavioral analysis is and its many benefits. Again, it's an evidence-based support utilizing, utilized to do a lot of things, to teach skills, to teach staff, and to reduce problem behavior. Some other things school environments can do is employ BCBAs, BCABAs, RBTs in the school environment. So with teaching assistants, for example, if you have an RBT as your teaching assistant, that's a step in the right direction. That individual is gonna have a background in behavioral analysis and can assist with those behavioral management strategies that we ultimately have to use. If you have a BCBA or a BCABA in classroom environments, they can assist with supervising the classroom. They can make recommendations to the teachers, changes to the environment that can produce those better outcomes. We can also take into consideration the teaching resources and their classroom culture. Again, with behavioral analysis, the goal here is not to change anything. I'm not trying to go into a classroom and tell teachers, do this, do that, you should change this lesson or that lesson. Absolutely not. Our goal with behavioral analysis is to be a supplement, to work together with the teacher, to produce those good outcomes, to make your classroom culture as effective as it needs to be. And we simply want to produce better outcomes. That's really the goal with behavioral analysis, is to identify why a problem is occurring, identifying the reasons, and going about changing it. We have to get out of this mindset of blaming the student. I can't have this student in my classroom because of this, this, and this, or this student isn't learning because of this, this, and this. If we employ that worldview, we're never going to go forward. We have to look at the environment. We have to look at what can we do better to produce better outcomes. If I blame my staff for every mistake they make, I'm doing a huge disservice 
because I'm not fixing the problem. I need to look at the situation, look at the environment, make a change for myself, and I will see better outcomes with my staff. If we employ that same method with our children, they're gonna be unstoppable. We have to do that. We have to look at what we can do to produce better outcomes for our kids. And I can't say it enough, a behavior analytic approach can absolutely assist with this. What's our terminal goal here with inclusion? To improve quality of life. I wanna improve the child's quality of life who has a developmental disability. I want them to be exposed to things that they need to be exposed to. I want them to experience things I want them to experience. I want them to develop social skills, communication skills, having a friend. That can be done through inclusion. We have to strive for that. Applied behavioral analysis is an evidence-based science, which can be utilized to meet those outcomes. It has been successful. There's research to back it up. And it's been shown to be an effective method. What we have to do now is disseminate. People need to be aware of behavioral analysis. People need to be aware of curriculums like the PEAK curriculum that can be utilized in school environments. People need to be aware that shadow teachers should be trained in the principles of applied behavioral analysis. Teachers need to be aware of what behavioral analysis is and how they can use it in their classroom. Because by doing that, we meet this terminal goal. We're able to improve a child's quality of life. And at the end of the day, that's gotta be our primary focus. If you'd like more resources on behavioral analysis, I have a wonderful website, www.bacb.com, that will provide you a lot of information as far as international certification standards for behavioral analysis, but it also talks a lot about where ABA can be utilized, particularly in school environments. Again, there's a lot of practical application that, that, can, become, that, can, can, that can come from this, and it's really important for us to be aware of those things and for us to employ them in those classroom environments. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen uh, so far to what I've had to present on. And I am more than happy to answer any questions that you might have on behavioral analysis, on its uh, utilization in an inclusion effort and how ABA could be utilized with challenging behavior and skill acquisition. Thank you, Mr. Nicholas. And uh, I think we have a lots of informative questions. I mean, interactive questions from the audience. Uh, there are around 19 questions. So uh, would, you like, uh, would you like us to go through them? Please, yeah, absolutely. Okay, the first question from Ms. Mirvat. If the behavior hurt the kid like throwing himself to do what he wants, how we can control them? First, that's a wonderful question. Thank you so much for asking that. So. When we have that problem behavior occurring, that's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a scary thing, right? A child's engaging in problem behavior that could potentially hurt themselves. So the first thing we wanna do is ensure the child's safety. That's number one that comes above anything. So ensuring their safety is gonna be important. Now, if it's simply something they don't wanna do, we wanna look at all the variables associated with that. So for example, let's look at the level of work first. Is it too hard? Is it too easy? I once uh, was working in a, um, uh, a, a classroom environment in the United States in New York, and I had a child starting to engage in problem behavior. And this child never engaged in problem behavior before. He was, and he would throw himself down on the floor. And what I came to find out was for three out of the six hours this child was in school, he was beating a thread. So it wasn't that the work was too hard, the work was too easy. He got bored, he engaged in problem behavior. So I think the first thing we want to do is look at the level of work. What are we asking the child to do? Is it too hard? Is it too easy? The, we also want to look at some of the other variables um, associated with, are we spending too much time doing the work? Um, are all of the child's friends outside when he's inside doing the work? We want to look at all of these environmental variables. And by looking at those things, that can help us identify, do we need to make a change? Again, I don't want to look at this child and say, you're throwing yourself down on the floor. This is your challenge. You need to stop doing it. What we really have to do is look at the environment and see what can we change in the environment to produce a better outcome. So I hope that answers your question. That was a wonderful question. Thank you. Okay, and we have another question from Sonia. When they keep asking and do it nicely to go somewhere and it is not allowed, and she keeps asking and asking what to do. I think it's similar questions to Ms. Mirvat. 
Yes. So I, I, this is a wonderful, wonderful question. Um, so the, the question becomes, OK, let's say we teach the child to ask for something. Now, we, we do this at Dubai Autism Center all the time. So we'll have a child engaging in problem behavior, uh, let's say because they want a cookie, for example. So I will we will come up with a teaching procedure and we'll teach them to ask for cookie. So they don't engage. Let's say they're hitting themselves in the head, for example. So we teach them an appropriate behavior and the, the child no longer engages in the problem behavior. They no longer hit themselves. They ask for cookie. But now what happens? Well, the child's going to ask 700 times a day, right? The child's going to just ask all the time. So now the next step of this skill is teaching the child how to wait and how to accept no. And that comes to the very specific teaching procedure. Now, what's good about this opportunity is that you have a naturalistic opportunity to teach this skill, and you'd wanna do it through a very, very precise uh, method. I would suggest having a BCBA or BCABA supervise a program like that, but there are some wonderful curriculums. Uh, two I would recommend are a work in progress and crafting connections. Um, they absolutely have some some programs in there to teach those very skills. Like I said, I would suggest that uh, program be implemented or overseen by a BCBA or a BCABA. But the goal there, use it as an opportunity to teach a skill for an unmet need. Great question. Uh, I just want to say that we're trying to answer all of your questions because I think the questions are increasing. It's around 33 questions now. So uh, I will go quickly through all of sure. them uh, because we have only 13 minutes. Sure. Uh, so the next. So the next question is how we can improve virtual uncontrollable environments in the distance learning context. Great question. Yeah, so the, the whole COVID situation has thrown us a curveball and this is uncharted territory thing for everybody. Um, it's very, very challenging, particularly when you're having um, academic instruction done virtually. It's very challenging. It's challenging for the parents. I mean, really, that's what it comes down to, right? Because as a parent, you ultimately have to um, do certain things. Um, here, here's what we need to do. First of all, my, my first suggestion would be we want to look at the child's schedule and environment outside of academic instruction. Is the child able to engage in fun activities? Are they able to get outside? Are they able to do some things? I know obviously social distancing is a must at this point, but we really want to look at what is the child doing for any kind of activity, any kind of fun thing. Uh, once we've identified that, we feel that that's appropriate. The next step is going to be, OK, let's let's look at fading in some some requests. Now, parents, that's going to require you to be trained on specific things that that we need to do. The goal is going to be we have to make learning fun. And how do we do that? We do that. We can absolutely do that through an ABA approach where we're associating learning with fun things. So, for example, it could be something as simple as using what's called the pre-MAC principle where you could say, OK, we're going to spend two minutes doing some work and then you'll have two minutes with the iPad um, setting those kind of general contingencies. The one thing I would recommend is fading in academic instruction. So what we did at Dubai Autism Center was we started off with video models, very, very simple, simple programs, simple video models, and then we faded in the complex, the, the complex programs that we ultimately do. And that's why for us, we had really good outcomes with that. So I would suggest if that's an ongoing educational platform you're utilizing, looking at the, the environment of the individual, just making sure that they're having access to a lot of activities, fun things outside, and systematically fading in the complexity of the request and the work. If we go from nothing to 45 minutes at, at a computer, that's gonna produce probably not so great outcomes. If it starts off with three minutes or five minutes and then you slowly fade up, we tend to see better results. Great question, thank you for that. Okay, another question from Mirfat. If they want to take an APA course, can you help them to know where they can take online course? Yes, I absolutely can. Um, I'll try to find this right now. There's, um, there's a free RBT course um, through, um, hold on, I'm gonna, I'm going to Google and talk at the same time because I want to send you this link um, through the Autism Partnership Foundation. If I send a link, uh, will they be able to see it? Yes, I will be sharing it with them. Now. Oh, wonderful. OK, let me. Um, where can I? Oh, hold on. I can see. It. OK, yeah. So I'm going to share you got uh, share with you a link. By yourself. You can announce it. You can go to publish and the Q&A. Uh, oh. You can paste it there. Yeah. Wonderful. Hold on. I'm going to publish this. Um, 
Yeah. Great. Okay, I think I published this. Okay, let me see. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, great. Um, okay. This is a free because uh, I, I always like people to access things for free. Um, I, I don't like people paying for things. So um, check this out. It's a free RBT course. Um, it's done by some of the leaders in the field. Um, one of my uh, doctoral professors is the one who who runs it, and he's an amazing guy. Um, so check this out. That's that would be a free resource. I'd suggest checking that out first, um, and also checking out the BACB website, and that there's a lot of resources there. Okay, Mr. Nicholas, there are lots of questions, and okay. I'm really advising <laughs> you to go and read them in the new sure. questions. Um, okay, let me see which question we can take. Um, other than education and teaching people of determination, where can you work and utilize ABA? Oh, I love this great question. Yeah, so you can do a lot. Um, like I said before, human resources, organizational behavioral management. You know, we there's always, you know, when, when you look at bosses in, in older movies, like the, the boss that pounds their fist and yells at their staff, that that's viewed as strong leadership. That's the worst kind of leadership you can see. You want to focus on reinforcement. You want to focus on increasing incentive, creating great environments for your staff to want to work. So in business, this is valuable. You actually find that utilizing an ABA approach in a business environment produces better outcomes. I, my work, the staff at Dubai Autism Center, I guarantee work better because we utilize positive reinforcement. Instead of telling everyone what they're doing wrong, we tell them what they're doing right. And I promise you that that produces really, really great uh, results. So in human uh, behavior management, ABA can be utilized. You're also seeing it now being utilized in mental health fields. You, you're seeing that um, being utilized there. In nursing homes with uh, individuals with uh, traumatic brain injuries, there's um, a, a lot of use of, of behavioral approaches. So um, it's definitely well-rounding. It's a new field. So what's really great about it is that you're seeing it spring up in a lot of new places that you've never even seen before. But uh, we are slowly getting in there and embedding in there. So there's a lot of opportunities uh, for people to work in this field. Wonderful question. Thank you. And there is another good question. Thank you for highlighting the benefits of inclusion. However, from my own experience, class size does impact the quality of inclusion. What would you consider to be an ideal class size to ensure that the environment will be uh, will be conducive to learning? Please consider that we do not all have teaching assistants. Yeah, so that, that's a, that's a wonderful question and you're 100 percent correct in that. Look, if you have a classroom of even 15 students and, and one learner, um, who's having some challenges that that can be a huge challenge. So I, I'm totally sympathetic and I, I totally understand that. Um, you're not going to like my answer though, because I'm going to say it depends. It depends on a lot of variables. It depends on the culture of the classroom environment, depends on the age. It also depends on the supports that the child ultimately is going to need. But he, here's the rule of thumb. The goal has to be as a teacher, you have to implement your classroom environment uh, with and be able to meet all of your objectives. If you can't do that, that would suggest that you need an additional support. So classroom size absolutely does affect. It really depends on a lot of those variables that we have to analyze um, to make your classroom work effective. But the goal is you have 16 students that need to be educated at the end of the day. And if that doesn't happen, that would suggest that you need some additional support. Yeah, really good question. OK, another question. Who will create those ABA strategies for the teacher and help apply them in the classroom when there yeah. is no teacher assistant and a special education teacher, if available, doesn't teach SOD English? Yeah, th th that's a good question. I, I can tell you the model in the United States is um, there will be a behavior analyst. Schools will actually hire behavior analysts that will come into classrooms and will will do these things. And there is a huge need for that. Uh, but let's say in, in your school environment, you don't yet have that. Um, the school counselor uh, school or school psychologist um, could also be the individual that ultimately uh, implements those procedures. The thing we got to keep in mind, though, is that a psychology worldview is much different than a behavioral one. So based on their training and their um, academic internship experience, that could also be a challenge for that as well as far as embracing that behavior analytic worldview. The goal is you'd want to consult with somebody. What is wonderful is that there are companies 
that have BCBAs that will come in to function as consultants, where they'll, they'll help you in your classroom environment come up with some strategies to make your classroom more effective. Thank you. That was the question from Asya from Alhur School. Now, the, now another question from Aisha Galadari. How we can ensure successful application of ABA principles with a study from home, as is the case currently, with the yeah. students who have a hard time maintaining focus when studying online, thus engaging in problem behaviors? Please note we have six more minutes to go. <laughs> Sure, I'll try to go quickly with this. Um, so really um, what we want to do in, in this particular opportunity is look at those general problem behaviors and identify why they're occurring. So like I said, if we have a child that's sitting at home all day and then we bring them work to do, of course they're going to engage in problem behavior. That can't shock us, right? So I always encourage people, look at the general schedule of the child. What are they doing throughout the day? And that produces a lot of good opportunities and a lot of areas of improvement. Also, look, I'm a behavior analyst. I love occupational therapy. Uh, involving other individuals that can assist with these types of things would also be good. And I, I, I work with brilliant occupational therapists at Dubai Autism Center, and they would always um, work collaboratively and we come up with some general strategies to the, for that. So I would suggest first looking at the schedule and working collaboratively. Involve other disciplines in your school to assist with these challenges and um, make the recommendations based off of that. Excellent question. Thank you for that. Thank you. And there's a question from Lemia Ali. Is it possible to train teachers to change their environments to cater for their students' needs? 100%. Yes. And that's got to be the goal, right? Because at this point, what we want to do is look at the environment and have that perspective, have that worldview as far as this is happening. I need to change this. I need to change that. Absolutely. I do think a behavior analytic worldview from a teaching perspective can be an incredible one. And I do, I, I've worked with teachers that, that have been trained in behavioral analysis and do that, and their classrooms are amazing. So absolutely, we just focus on training that teacher. Really great question. Thank you for that. Thank you. And question from Wala. I'm LSA, my student five years autistic with a speech delay. Now he can interact with his peers in the indoor play area, but depends on me totally. If okay. I am not there with him in the play area, he takes a corner by himself. How can I help him? OK, so we got some good news. The good news is the child can engage in the behavior we want them to, and that's awesome. Now, the next step is we got to fade you as the LSA out of the equation so the child can do it independently. Now, how do we do that? And again, I'm not going to suggest that I, I, I haven't obviously seen this situation, so I'm very limited as far as what I can recommend. But here's what I would suggest. At this point, what we want to do is slowly fading yourself out a dimension of what you're doing. So for example, if you're telling the child, go play with them, start by using a gestural prompt. Start by taking one step back. Very, very small things to start fading yourself out. And the goal is gonna be fade yourself out totally. Now, having said that, I have not observed this student, um, so I'm, I'm really at a, a huge deficit as far as making specific recommendations. I would highly suggest, if possible, a, a trained behavioral analyst or assistant behavior analyst come in, assist, make recommendations so that those outcomes could be beneficial. But I'm, I'm really happy to hear the positive thing about your about your student and uh, best of luck to them. And thank you for the question. OK, I think we're almost done. And I don't th I don't know if it is, uh, you know, feasible to have one more question, but sure, uh, please. I, I can stay on as long as you. you we have another session is going to start okay, in so. a minute. That's why. <laughs> sure. Thank you so much, Mr. Nicholas, and thank yeah. you so much for the audience. And it looks really that you all enjoyed with lots of interactive questions. And in case if you have more questions to Mr. Nicholas, I don't know in case if you have, um, you know, a way for them to communicate with you in case if they, you know, yeah. there are a lot of questions unanswered. Maybe they would love to speak with you. Of course, yeah. So um, if everyone can go on, uh, Facebook's probably the, the best uh, communication mode. Dubai Autism Center. Uh, we have a Facebook page. Uh, we also have an option to send messages through that. So please feel free to send uh, any questions that you have. I will be more than happy to take time to, to answer it. Uh, I think we have one more time. I think they spared us five more minutes. Oh, Thank wonderful. <laughs> okay. Great. Sorry, sorry for that. So let me go scroll up because, yeah, there are questions unanswered. This is Osama no. Lala. Hello, Mr. Osama. We'll take only five more minutes from you. Sorry. No problem. No problem. <laughs> I am. Uh, 
it's uh, because it is very important question and it's important <laughs> subject. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Also. Thank you. I appreciate thank it. You. Um, there are audience uh, who is asking for your PowerPoint presentation. Is it a way yeah. for sending it to them? That's fine. Yeah. Yes, 100%. Absolutely. Yep. OK, so let me see one question from um, anonymous uh, person. When a student is upset and has to stay back from physical training class because he couldn't complete his work because he was often distracted, what to do? Yeah, so I mean, look, here's the challenge. I, you know, with, with children that are left back to do work, I always feel that that's kind of, it can, kind of creates an unfair condition for the child, right? Because the, the child is going to engage in challenging behavior um, or, or have a sense of feeling that, well, why am I being left out? It's another way that we're excluding the child from the environment. So the goal is, how can we prevent that from happening? How can we have the, this child stay on track with everybody else? And that's got to be what we look at. So we want to look at, does this child need an additional support? Do they need the work broken down for them? Is there something we can do to make the work simpler? Um, looking at those variables, I think will be very beneficial and will produce the outcomes in which we want. Yeah, great okay. question. OK, another question. A student of determination or special needs is bullied by the mischievous student of yeah. the class. How to cope with the scenario? So I, I can tell you what, what, what we've done in the past and, and what I think we should do. Um, really, with, with bullying, it, it's, a, it's a tough one because at the end of the day, there's a dynamic set forward that being different is a bad thing. Um, so obviously, whatever policies the school ultimately has, um, we need to follow through on. Again, as a behavior analyst, I look at proactively. What do we do? We have to train kids at a young age on what autism is and why it's OK to be different. So um, what we're actually uh, in the process of doing at Dubai Autism Center is doing some initiatives for that, where um, hopefully when, when things uh, slowly return back to normal, um, we're going to be doing some trainings for, for kids in school environments as far as what are some things that we can do to help children see or understand at a very, very young age that being different is OK. That being different doesn't mean that you have to be bullied. So I would suggest the answer lies, and it, it's more of a systemic question than anything else, but I think that general education can be very, very beneficial. Yeah. Thank you Great so question. much, Mr. Nicholas. I think I'm going to share the questions with you. Maybe you can post it in your Facebook account because yeah. I think we already run out of time. Thank you, Mr. Sure. Ulala. Thank you, Mr. Usama Ulala. <laughs> Thank you so much. And, um, and thank you for all. And this is the end of the session, so cheers all. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I appreciate it.